Good evening, everyone, and thanks for staying. This is the last event of today. I hope you're not too tired, but this should be a little bit more entertaining. So tonight, we're going to be talking about the Rust project, how it's organized, how it works, what it means to contribute to the Rust project, and we'll take a peek a little bit of what to expect into the future, starting off from what Nico talked about this morning. But before we go into the nitty gritty, let's get an introduction with all the folks on stage. You probably know them, but I'll give them a chance to introduce themselves. Uh, I guess I'll start. Uh, my name is Mara. Um, you might know me from Twitter, where I tweet a bunch of curse code with pink backgrounds. I um, am one of the team leads of the lib uh, library team of the Rust project. I'm the author of uh, Rust Atomics and Locks. Um, and I do a bunch of random stuff in the project, like mostly leadership related. Like in 2021, I uh, helped out running the edition together with uh, Nico mm -hmm. and Ryan. And I am part of the leadership council. Um, and I don't know, whenever something needs to happen in a project, I take up too many responsibilities. So you might see my name appear in all kinds of places. It's a pretty long list. <laughs> Okay, so hi, I'm Jonathan Pallant. You'll know me online from uh, as the JP star, uh, GitHub, Mastodon, whatever. Um, I do rust like 24 hours a day, it seems. It's my day job at Ferris Systems where we do training and I make ferrocene. I'm on the Rust Leadership Council and then all of my side projects and hobbies seem to be rust related. You'll see in the talk later. Um, yeah, so that's me. So hi, I'm Nico. You may remember me from this morning uh, <laughs> where I introduced myself, so I'll just like skip past that part. Um, I do a lot of things. I write a blog. That one I didn't mention this morning. That's, yeah, I work on the language design. In case you weren't here, I work on the language design and type system, especially these days. Nice. So let's start from the very basics, right? Because I think here we have a group of people. Some might be contributors. A lot of them might be Rust users. So when we say the Rust project, what do we actually mean? Like, what is the Rust project? That's a tricky question. I mean, we have a definition of Rust project. Like, we have, we have a list of people who are on the several teams that make up the Rust project, like library team, language team, et cetera. Um, but then there's lots of working groups, um, which are, well, those are separate from the teams. And then we have hundreds, maybe thousands of contributors. So sometimes when people say the Rust project, they're talking about the people who make the decisions about whatever they're currently working on, which is usually like the language team or the Lips API team and so on. Um, but when people say, oh, the, the Rust project is working on something, they often mean just the whole set of contributors, which grows every day and changes every day. Um, this, this is an ongoing question also on the agenda of the, the leadership council. Like the council tries to represent the Rust project, but what is the project? That's, that's a thing that we need to well, keep reminding ourselves that this is something that changes all the time. I think to, to add to that, the working groups are, are an interesting thing, right? The so teams, you feel like they've got a job to do for the tool chain. The working groups, uh, so we've got a game dev working group, an async working group, an embedded working group, a CLI working group, and I apologize to all the other working groups if I've forgotten you, because I'm your representative on the leadership council, and it's kind of a thing I should <laughs> remember. But, and they, they vary in size. Some have got Rust embedded working group, must be you know, 100 odd people, and some of them are very small, it's just a handful. Um, and they were sort of created to do a job to, to push a specific thing that Rust can do. And now they sort of, there's a spectrum. There's people in the working groups who want to work on the tool chain and make Rust better. And there are other people in the working groups who use Rust and want to do good things with Rust. And that becomes a very interesting question. Is that the project? using Rust, or is the project the tool chain? And there's something else for this uh, word for people who use Rust. If you have answers to these questions, call me. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm going to give you my answer. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think you all captured it. But we've got a lot of words that we've used in inconsistent ways. Mm, I feel guilty of this, having like reused the same word multiple times, often with a different OK, this is the new meaning I have. But lately, at least, I've been thinking a lot about 
distinguishing kind of the maintainers, the people who take ownership of something and keep it going over a long period of time, from developers, the people who are taking something and trying to build it and make it happen in the first place, such that it gets handed off to the maintainers. And it feels like the maintainers often align really well with teams, sort of the ones who are making the decisions. And it kind of makes sense because they're taking responsibility in the end for that thing that you worked on. You might go off and do whatever, but the team is going to have to keep that going. From that point of view, I think like what we call the embedded. It used to be, I think, that the working groups were more the people building out something. But now you have like the embedded working group with its own family of libraries and support things that it maintains and supports. And so I don't think that lines up. But I do find that the distinction between maintaining and building first helps me like stay aligned, no matter what label we happen to be giving it right now. I see. So I guess the answer is nuanced. It's not really a basic question. But let's go into a little bit how you came to be here, right? A little bit your hero origin story, if you want. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you get to join the Rust project? Like, what brought you to the Rust compiler repository organization? Um, I was using Rust at my own company uh, since, I think, 2017, 18, something like that. And I think I started contributing when I just started running into things, small things I wanted to change. I think the very first contribution was literally a one-line change. I wanted to, we have all these mathematical constants in the side library for floats like pi and e, et cetera. And at work, we use, we use tau a lot, like two times pi. And I saw there was, was a little discussion in the past about adding it and it was rejected. But um, I also saw that some other languages did add it, and how do, now since those previous discussions, there was actually new data about how that was used in those other languages. So I collected the data, presented it, and people voted in favor of it and accepted my one-line change. And that was kind of the start that made me realize, like, oh, by just you know typing things in my computer, looking up information, and convincing people, I can make real things happen to this language. So I tried bigger and bigger and bigger things, and. I don't know, a few months later, I ended up being a reviewer and then team member and then team lead of the library team. Um, yeah, uh, I just kept applying the same trick, but then to bigger things, I guess. My, my story with Rust starts in 2016. I've always been an embedded developer since I put wheels on my Commodore 64 and turned it into a robot. Um, and C was how you did embedded development. And I didn't love it, if I'm honest. Uh, I think Nell quoted me at Rust London as someone who was saved from a life of professionally disappointing development in C. And that's what Rust did. It came along, someone sent me an email, hey, have you seen this cool thing? They've just hit 1.0. I'm like, wow, this, this fixes like not everything, but like most of it, this is good build system problems, documentation problems. And so I became an avid Rust user, and I immediately wanted to use it on microcontrollers, and there it was not good. This is like 2017, maybe. There was a, there was a bunch of work to do, and I was interested in doing the work. So I don't know, as, as the way these things happen, sort of there's some gravity, and these people come together, and uh, the Rust Embedded Working Group um, happened, and that was sort of my, my in. And then recently, electing members of the Rust Leadership Council. Each councillor represents a team. And in the formation of the council, it was realized that working groups are not teams. And so all the working groups were put in a team called the Launching Pad. And the idea of that is we're going to launch the working groups somewhere. Uh, some of them will be teams. Some of them will be turned into something else. I don't know. If you have ideas, call me. Uh, so I sit on the leadership council by virtue of being in the Rust Embedded Working Group and someone nominated me. So yeah, not a compiler contributor. I have one PR. It's from four weeks ago. Um, basically, it was because I needed a gag as part of a talk. So yeah, you can, <laughs> you can come at this stuff without being a compiler developer. You don't have to be like a tool chain wizard. You can just be interested and get involved. Mm. I'm going to go way back for my origin story <laughs> and say in sophomore year of college, I was studying things and I took a class in compilers and I was like, wow, this is really cool. These are the kinds of programs I want to write. 
and the rest is history. I mean, basically, it's true. That's pretty much all I've done since then. Uh, I went on to do a PhD uh, because I realized that I didn't know a lot of stuff, and that would help me learn it. And then came to Mozilla, and they were working on this wacky language called Rust, and I started working on that, and that's kind of brings me to here, essentially, on a straight line. Okay, <laughs> so more or less you all started, I think, before 2017, 2018, we trust in various shapes and form. I don't know when you went to college, I'm not going to ask. <laughs> um, if somebody from the audience or, you know, from elsewhere wanted to start getting involved today with trust in a more active fashion, what would be the ideal starting point from your point of view? Where would you suggest them to go? That's a really tricky question. I think I only have those. I guess. Yes, <laughs> yes, I noticed. Um, for me, it was kind of easy because at the time there was sort of a gap in the project. Like the library team had become a lot less active, and I was interested in exactly that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I could just start doing stuff, and people were like, "Oh, great, keep doing that." Um, as the project grows, these gaps are well still there in many places, but they're just less obvious, I guess. Um, I think one of the things we need to work on is is for the people already experienced in the project to spend even more time than they're already doing on yeah, scaling up the project, mentoring other people. I only recently started writing down basically my ideas when they're not complete yet, just writing down issues with basically mentoring instructions out for someone else to get involved. I want to do way more of that if that's successful. Um, but something else we should look at is contributions that are not usually thought of as contributions. Like if you go to GitHub and you look at contributions, it often just counts commits and maybe sometimes issues, but there are so many ways to contribute to the REST project that we currently don't see a lot of people show up, especially around project management. For the uh, 2021 edition, lots of people had ideas of what they wanted to contribute in code and features and almost no one stepped up to actually coordinate, collect those things and make a plan. And now for this edition, I'm seeing that there are several people stepping up to do that. And so I think we are slowly improving there, but we need to do that a lot faster. I think we need to make more space and make it much clearer how people can contribute in, in all those ways. Um, yeah, I guess that. Uh, I have a question because I want to check how this reference is going to go down. How many people have seen the Netflix animated movie, The Mitchells versus the Machines? Not many of you. Okay. <laughs> this isn't going to work. Uh, in this movie, there's a dysfunctional family and a kid has to go to college and her problem is she needs to find her scene, her crowd. She doesn't fit in with what she's doing. College is this opportunity to find the people she wants to hang out with. And for her, in her case, it's the film nerds, they make movies and so on. Rust is like, I don't know, your first couple of weeks at university. There's all these different societies, there's all these things going on, and it's a lot. And how do you find what works for you? Try some, hang out, listen in, see what's going on, see what works for you, and if it doesn't work, it's fine. Try another one, try three at once, nobody's counting, it's fine. And where do these things hang out, given there is no uh, physical campus you can really visit? There's no hall you can wander down? Uh, maybe we should have one. Right? Maybe there should be some kind of exhibition where every team gets to put out a little stall saying, hey, join T-Lips. Um, in the absence of that, where do, where do you find people? You find them on Matrix, which is a decentralized chat thing. Google for uh, matrix.org. Uh, look up online for a working group or a team and you may find they have a matrix chat that you can join or they may be on Zulip. Again, another chat thing that exists. Uh, so if you hear people talking about matrix and Zulip, those are chat programs. That's, I think, mainly where the working groups and the teams hang out. Find their web page, have a look at rustlang.org. They'll tell you where they hang out. Go and turn up, sit in on a meeting, watch, learn, observe. And then you go, yeah, this is interesting. I can see some things I can help here. Issue trackers, I think we're very, pretty good at marking things good first issue. Uh, I don't think there's many open source projects, many tool chain projects certainly that go, yeah, here's an incredibly complicated million line thing, but this is a great place to start. And we mark them because it's a great place to start. So yeah, go and, go and find your crowd and, uh, and hang out. And they're fun. 
you should do it. So I love those answers. Totally agree. I was going to say sort of the same thing, but with a different maybe angle, which is it depends kind of what you want to do and get out of it. But if what you want to do is have the maximum like impact on Rust itself, on making things happen, I absolutely think project management is one of the areas where you can have that impact. Right? We have had a lot of really good ideas uh, over the years, but what's missing usually is someone to dive in, understand. It could be something like sometimes it's a gigantic GitHub thread that has probably unearthed every possible aspect of that idea over time, but we all kind of lost the thread, no pun intended, and somebody needs to kind of go in and read it and figure out what was there and summarize it and bring it back to the attention and kind of raise it up again. And until then, it's just going to sit. Or it could be collecting the issues, tracking them, reminding people to do the reviews they need to do and push that thing over the limit. I also think there's a lot of work that's really cool and often overlooked in building tooling, frankly, to help the Rust project function and help make project management less painful, less like searching through GitHub interfaces. We were just talking the other day about how uh, you know, we have this bot called TriageBot, and it's there. To, it lets people add labels. It lets them do a few basic things. But many teams, like the language team and the types team especially, have a need for tracking issues over time, for making up uh, reports that we can review. And we've kind of worked out workflows for how to do that. But we don't have, no one's had the time or motivation to build the, the bot to do it. So we end up doing it by hand. And it takes hours and hours, and things fall through the gaps. And uh, it's just a kind of a, a shame. And I think that these, these areas are where you may not be writing the code for the feature, at least not right away, but you will actually be the one that makes the feature get over the line. Right? We've recently had a person come in and get involved in the Lang team whose name is TC. And it's been kind of transformative having somebody who every week helps prepare an agenda, goes through the issues, tracks out, helps us focus our attention so that when all of us get together for one hour, we can be a lot more efficient. Right? And that's something that I used to try to do. In principle, the leads should try to do. But often, there's a lot of demands on their time, and it's not actually possible. So it just doesn't happen. Um, so I think those areas are really exciting. Also, authoring documentation, helping people learn. I mean, there's just so many different areas around the code to get involved. The coding is actually like the most popular one, but then in some ways the hardest because there's so many people. Like, yes, we have good first issues, but they disappear in 20 to 30 minutes, right? Because it's like, oh, oh there's one I can actually do without having much context. I'll take it. It isn't to say you shouldn't do that. You know, go ahead, look, that's awesome. There, you, I think there's lots of ways to get involved with coding, and we can talk about that. But it is actually a harder road uh, to get from writing code to having impact, even though that seems more direct than coming in and helping with organization or maybe finding someone who you know, has an idea that they've wanted to drive for a long time, but they haven't had time to do it. Work with them closely uh, and see if the, maybe you can set up a relationship to meet one-on-one -on -one and let them talk to you about what's keeping them back and how you can help unblock them. I think those are great ways to get involved. So I guess starting from that, right? Uh, this morning, you showed a few graphs of number of downloads, number of crates, showcasing a little bit what's the growth of the ecosystem. And I went and did a little bit of Git archaeology in the Rust Lang repo. And how many contributors do you think there were in the last year? What's the number? Top of mind. Mm -hmm. so, well, I think it was on one of the talks that I watched, but I've forgotten <laughs> <laughs> I've <laughs> how many PRs. It was smaller than you might have thought. For unique new, con you mean new contributors? Heard, Jonathan. Oh, wait, this is, we turn this into a game show. I'm going to go higher than 500. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 1,055 in the last 365 days, and interestingly, 60% of those are recurring contributors. So people who have more than one commit inside the repository. And so my question is. How is the project coping with that scale from a human perspective? So Nico mentioned that project management obviously is an issue. You mentioned before that the project is restructuring. What are the plans in this direction? And what are the main challenges from your point of view? I'm going to look at Nico to take that first. 
All right. Uh, <laughs> how are we coping with that scale? I, I'm actually not sure. I think unevenly is probably the answer. Like, I think review times are a big problem. I think a lot of people get really frustrated that they put in a bunch of work, come in, open PRs, and then don't get much of a response. And that comes back a little bit to this project management. Just there's so much going on. It's not that anyone is out to overlook your work. Of course, they're just dropping balls left and right, and yours is maybe sometimes one of them because there's too many. So that, that's the bad side. But then when I see those kind of numbers, I do also feel like yeah, we're doing something right. right? There's, we are able to kind of get peer people engaged. There, I feel like, uh, well, I'll use the types team as an example, actually. That's one of the new patterns I've seen cropping up more and more, where we'll see that there's an area that is like a sub part of a team's uh, mandate that is being underserved. So in the case of the type system, it was sort of a narrow specialty within the compiler, and there weren't enough people, so bandwidth was always very low. So we created a dedicated team for it um, and got the two or three people who had been in that area sort of were the seed and then grown it over time. And I think it has had, like our velocity is much higher than it used to be. We're still working on, it seems to me, we can still have lots of room to grow and onboard new people. It's a high context area, but that's a good tool and we've seen it used elsewhere, like the OpSem team for operational semantics. I mean, these are the ones that are on my mind because they're close to what I do. But you know, identifying a subgroup where you're having trouble making progress and trying to pull it out and focus on it particularly seems to be really useful as a pattern. I guess, does that answer your question? I don't know. That's what I like to see us do to get better at it, <laughs> among other things. So, so this is an interesting question because I don't know. I'm not a contributor and I'm not in a team that does work. I'm in the weird team that's made of all the working groups. So I don't have good visibility on that. So maybe there's something the leadership council should be doing to try and get a little bit of information of each, from each team on a regular basis and share it. I think we could maybe do a better job of just understanding what's it like where you are, what's it like where you are, where can we help out? So I'm going to take that away. Yeah, the scalability of our project is a thing that keeps coming up. I think right now we're not doing a great job at, I don't know, our review times and everything else for, uh, like for the contributor experience just because Rust is scaling so fast. You saw the exponential graphs that's Basically, every number in Rust is going that way. Um, we need to put more effort into scaling up the project. And I think a lot of it comes from non-technical solutions, but there are also some very interesting technical solutions to look at. Like for the library team, one of the first questions we ask when someone throws a new feature is, can you first implement it outside the standard library in a separate crate? And for a lot of things like, uh, I don't know, a new method or something that's relatively easily possible, but there are too many things where the answer is simply no. It's technically not possible to do this in a different place. And if in those cases we can work on some features that do allow these things, then more evolution can happen in parallel. Um, but yeah, I, I think we should do more to uh, get more people to contribute in, in project management ways. I think if we already came several, uh, up several times in this in this panel, um, I, if I think back about my own contributions, I think I've been pretty impactful for us. And I think my, all the code that I wrote was the least impactful thing I've, I've contributed to Rust. I think all the big impact I had on Rust was, um, yeah, everything to enable others, basically, like the, the managing library team, managing the, uh, the addition, um, writing documentation, writing plans, collecting information, things like that. And um, I don't remember who said it, but I think several people in the project have like the best way to be a 10 times engineer is to, yeah, enable many others around you instead of just trying to do more yourself. Um, that's, yeah, something we need to probably spend a lot more time on to, to scale up the project. So can I take us on a bit of a tangent? <laughs> it's sort Please. Of, I, I'm not sure if I'm answering this question or the one before or neither. Or the but one I was, you wish that was asked. You know, yeah. Maybe the one I wish was asked. But I'm, I'm thinking about what we've been saying and remembering that something else that, something else I've been observing lately is that I think, you know, uh, we have to recognize that there are just many different paths and motivations for coming into the project, right? 
Like, I think some people come with this classic, like, scratch your own itch, where there's a thing I really want to see done, and that's what I want to do. Um, and I think that's awesome. And often, I think that's not only awesome, I think it's essential because it's kind of part of how we prioritize uh, and choose what to do. It's like, if it's sufficiently important, then someone is probably motivated to work on it. That's helpful. But uh, there's another way, there's another route in, which is like, I see that something really cool is going on here, and I want to be a part of it, but I don't actually have a particular thing I want to do. I want to do what's most useful. I want to get involved and be a part of the community. And I see both happening a lot, and I think that kind of the recommendation for the route in is going to be very different, right? And I think we're better maybe at the first one to some extent. That's sort of the more traditional open source route and less good about helping people who want to be a part of things and want to be useful and helping them figure out what is the best place where they could get involved and be uh, sort of be useful. That makes sense. I wanted to ask one more question on this. Is the project structured in such a way that, oh, let me phrase it differently, is part of the issue that making changes in some parts of the compiler or the language or the tooling requires a lot of consensus across different teams, which is becoming increasingly difficult, or is the project factored out in such a way that each team is able to make progress semi-independently of most items? I don't know who's best to answer this. I think for a lot of things, it is just one team that makes the decision. I think the, the split we have in teams, we cannot obviously optimize it, but the current split we have tends to work out pretty well. Um, what we sometimes miss is when we're considering a solution for some problem, we sometimes miss that the same problem might also be solved with a solution in another team. So someone comes to the library team like, hey, if this library solution for this problem, and we then sometimes think, you know, we think it's better solved in the language. And then the language team discusses it, and they think it, you know, it might be better solved in the library team. And Something I know with discussions we had earlier this week over a beer is that it's kind of interesting how we can be more efficient by, you know, creating these little islands like 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 Nico talked about uh, type thing before. Like it can be very efficient ways to get something from. At the same time, you also want to keep the connection there, and it's sort of two opposing forces. And finding the balance there is is tricky, but very important. Yeah, I was gonna say. I mean, you always ship your org chart, right? That's like the classic phrase, meaning we definitely make most of the decisions within a single team. Whether we should be making those decisions within a single team is a different question. I think the answer is the teams are the way they are because most of the time it is a pretty good breakdown. A lot of that stuff is pretty specific to one area. But we have to be on the watch for those kind of scenarios. And some, something that Mara made me aware of in that conversation over beer was, was like, we don't necessarily do a good job of recognizing the prioritization dependencies between things. It's kind of like a lock, inverted lock priority or whatever you call that, right? So the, I forget what it was, but there was a language feature we were discussing, maybe something. And the idea was, on its own, it didn't look that high important to me. And it's, we haven't really paid a lot of attention to it, frankly, uh, in Lang team meetings. But it turns out it's blocking some library work that I totally agree is very important, something to do with C string interop and so on, right? And so language interop, I think, is important. That library work is important. And I wasn't really fully aware of the fact that, oh, this little thing over here is blocking that major goal that I think we all share. So highlighting those inter-team dependencies and helping everybody sort of realize the full path and impact of, of each piece of work seems like an area we can do a lot better. And I, I think that's where we often fall the, down the hardest. So you're saying we need a bar and we need to send Rust project developers to the bar more often so we that can identify help. these kinds of things. That's certainly one solution. <laughs> where are we going to put it? Oh, Let's move on. That sounds tricky. The metaverse is what it's for. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, Let's switch gear slightly, but not that much, right? Because we talked about coordination, alignment across teams. Let's take, uh, let's say, six to 12 months outlook forward. So looking at the near future, not that far into the future. What is happening in the REST project? Like, what do we expect to see, or what do we want to see in the next year or so? Obviously, we mentioned the addition this morning, which we can go into, but what else is boiling? 
Um, I, yeah, like you said, the most obvious thing is the addition. Um, we often don't work with, with a clear t time frame uh, because nearly all the work on Rust is, is voluntary one way or another. Um, I think the, the, the thing where I think we should make pay the most attention and where I expect a lot of things to be changing is um, like uh, the graph that Nika showed this morning of increasing usage of Rust, it doesn't mean that just more of the same software gets written. It means more different kinds of software get written, right? It means that before maybe Rust was used a lot in a few areas and now it's getting used in twice as many completely different areas. Maybe uh, like something we see going on is uh, Rust in the Linux kernel, for example. And we do a pretty good job at Rust for like in, in user space on servers and on desktops. And we do a pretty good job at Rust for embedded system, bare metal. But this is kind of in between. They have some certain needs that Rust currently doesn't meet. And currently they are dependent on a lot of changes in, in the language, in the library to, to fulfill their needs. And something, and we have two ways of going, right? We either just listen to their problems and address their problems directly, just make a version of Rust that fits for them perfectly. And I think actually we should not be doing that because that doesn't scale. What I want to look at is how we can enable them to solve their problems without, like, get rid of the, this, this dependency. Uh, what makes it currently impossible to solve their problems separately from the, the um, development of the language in the library, standard library. So, yeah, I guess I'm hoping that everything we see in the, in the next year or so has something to do with, with the scalability of the project and, yeah, maybe more importantly or equally of the, of the entire user base because at this growth, we, if, if we're not already running into problems, we are going to be running into problems how, how fast Rust is growing. In 12 months' time, I think all... Uh, what I want to see is projects still around, people happy, enjoying what they're doing. I want to see businesses taking advantage of Rust, being able to get long-term support on their tool chain. I think it's a really important thing to bring people in. Um, then we're going to see a lot in the automotive space, and I want that to be normal and not like, wow, really, they can do that? I want to be like, yeah, of course they can do that. Um, and on the project side, I want to, I would like to see a group, a team, a working group. I don't know. My job is to launch all the working groups. I can't start new ones. Maybe I can. Uh, but someone to just, a group to take a real focus on Rust when you're running on a system with no operating system or an operating system you don't know about. No STD. Even that is like a terrible description. Um, so yeah, I'd like to see a, a, some focus on that and how we improve that because that's really important for these uh, things like these automotive use cases. And I guess as the rep for the launching pad, hopefully in 12 months, we will have launched some things somewhere. Call me if you know where. <laughs> so I gave one answer already. I won't repeat it. I mean, I think the addition is huge. Got a lot of pieces. I think we're going to see, I think over the next year, it's going to be a lot of uh, high impact things. We're going to have async function and trait. We're going to have infiltrate and trait. We're going to have type alias infiltrate, I think, I hope. Uh, and a couple other cool language features. We're going to have a bunch of library things. But um, what I'm really interested in, to partially address what Mara was also saying, is can we get a better holistic picture of what people are sort of, what are the experiences that people are having as they use Rust now, positive and negative? Sort of what are the use cases that we're seeing uh, people trying? Which ones are really going well? Which ones are failing? We did something like this specific to async a couple of years ago. We called it the async vision document. I think some parts were really great and some parts were not so great. Um, my favorite part by far was what we called the status quo stories, where we basically just had people come and talk about, this is what I tried to do. This is where I got confused. And then we wrote them down and assembled it. And you could just read through it. And it would give you a surprisingly, to me at least, it was sort of surprisingly easy to get a pretty big, pretty good 
picture and it affected my opinion of like, oh, some problems that didn't seem so high priority to me before changed as I sort of talked it through with someone and asked them like, well, why did you do that? Or what did that code look like? And came to realize, oh, you know, that bug is really easy to hit and it has pretty severe consequences. Um, so I'd like to see us doing that, but more, more broadly and on a living and continually updated basis. Right? And I think that's another place where I could see a lot of contribution that, that's not coding. It's more outreach, developer advocacy. I don't know, there are different names for it. But it's talking to people and helping us understand what problems they're hitting and, and in which domains, right? And grouping them and making them fit together. And, and that connects to what Mara was saying, right? Because the Rust for Linux people are hitting lots of stuff in this kernel space. How much is that the same thing that the group you're just talking about is targeting? And how much is it actually a little different because they have an operating system in mind? I don't exactly know. But a lot of times, I'll read an RFC, and I'll read a motivation. And the motivation makes sense on its own. But what I'm missing is, is this the, how does this fit in the set of problems that people in that space encounter? Is it a big one, a tiny one? You know, it's kind of invasive. Does it make sense? And uh, it's hard to answer that without going and doing a bunch of research. Um, I think we should do that. OK, so I think we're running out of time. So I'm going to give you one last question, and then we're going to close it with that. Now, I've asked you before what's coming down the line and you know, what it means to contribute. And you've all given to me your duty answers, as in what you see as people are responsible or primarily involved in certain parts of the compiler. But if you personally had an extra 24 hours, right, and you were not looking for anything that is impactful, but something that is just fun or you care personally about, about Rust or the tool chain or the ecosystem, what would you be working on in those extra 24 hours? I would probably want to write another book. It, writing a book was a very satisfying experience, just going out and collecting a lot of information and <clears throat> working on something that's not ending up in PR next week, but in a book like next year. Um, the, the, the problem is that it requires a long focused periods of time where I can, I don't know, take a whole day and focus on something. Most of the work I do nowadays in Rust is half an hour here, half an hour there. Um, the, writing a book doesn't easily fit in that. So if I have another 24 hours, I, I would pick a few very interesting topics and just, yeah, work on those kind of things. I kind of miss that. I do more of what I do already, what I love to do is build <laughs> cool embedded stuff because I think it's a really, it's a really interesting way to get people uh, engaged with what this amazing language can do. At some of the talks we we saw earlier, we um, really showed off that if you build stuff, and it's very physical. This is why I'm an embedded person. People look at it and go, "Wow, I can see that. I can understand it. Maybe I can do that." And the answer is yes, you can. So more time, make more cool embedded projects that make people go, wow, that's really cool. I want to do some of that. So you're living the dream, basically. You just do more of what you're already doing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm try I was going to tell you that was cheating. Then I realized my answer is kind of the same, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which, which is, I think, uh, I would work on this experimental programming language I was playing with, Dada, that I called it, Dada Lang, which Probably I envision as a tinkering pot, and maybe it would be good on its own, but it mostly was a way to play with ideas for where Rust could go if it were free of some of its existing constraints, you know, and different ways to do borrowing and for type systems and gradual typing, because I thought it would be cool if to help people onboard to Rust, you didn't have to start with everything type checking and fully working 100%, but you could write code that always runs no matter what. No matter what compilation errors you get, unless it's like, well, let's say no matter what, it's going to run. It may panic very quickly, like, you know, and then you can tighten the screws and make it more constrained. I, I think that would be a great and interesting area to explore. Um, so I guess that's more of the same of what I normally do. So I take it back. It was a perfectly reasonable answer. <laughs> okay. Well, please give them a round of applause.